Hold on just a second. Okay, Greg. Um, we're going to begin now. Greg Schultz is going to be giving us an amazing um, presentation about an approach to large scale quantitative research. Take it away. All right. Thank you, Carmel. Thank you very much. All right. So, um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I can't quite see everybody the way it's set up, but I did scroll through and see some familiar faces and names. Thank you so much for coming today. Um, my name is Greg Schult, and I'm based at Conan University, and I'm going to be talking about an approach to large-scale quantitative research. Uh, so uh, if you don't know me or haven't sat in on one of my presentations uh, before, uh, I just want to give a little bit of a background so that you have a framework to understand uh, where I'm coming from with this, with these ideas today. So I happened to go through a very quantitative heavy uh, program uh, for graduate school uh, at the University of Hawaii in educational psychology. Um, it's not why I went through the, why I joined that program, but it just turned out to be that way. And actually really, really enjoyed uh, the stats classes that I took, uh, ended up taking as many as I could and uh, along the way had the opportunity to teach the department's introductory statistics class. Uh, probably one of my favorite teaching experiences. And when I ended up settling here in Japan and starting to get to know the community of language teachers, I encountered a fair amount of interest in uh, teachers who were uh, working at university in particular, but wanted to um, do more research and uh, didn't really have any training in stats or quantitative methods, and we're looking ways, looking for ways to get started. So I think it began with uh, maybe one workshop about 15 years ago uh, that I put together on a small scale action research project that included some statistics. And I had such a nice feedback from that, I started to do a couple others and eventually um, uh, decided to make that my focus for my non-teaching uh, work outside the classroom. And uh, I've probably done 40 or 50 workshops around the country and um, run a couple of online courses and moved into some large scale projects. And along the way, I've settled on three um, sort of guiding principles that uh, uh, work for the projects that I'm doing, but also what I am recommending for teachers who are looking to get started um, doing quantitative research. Uh, one is building a solid foundation of fundamentals. Uh, the topics that I was teaching in the introductory statistics class or that you might get in an intro, intro research methods class are absolutely critical. Um, they apply through the most advanced statistics that we use. And if you can get a really, really strong foundation on those fundamentals, um, you will actually know quite a lot and it'll make it a lot easier to pick up on more advanced topics. Second is the idea of doing research as professional development. And by this, I mean just kind of focusing on small scale research projects where you are treating it as a learning activity, um, not just trying to answer a research question. Um, but keeping it simple and small and making sure that you understand every step of the process that you go through, doing a lot of background reading and studying um, so that you are learning as you go along. And then as you sort of master different uh, approaches and designs, you build on that and do things that are bigger and more complicated. And then finally, um, I highly recommend that you find a partner or a small group of people who have shared goals. Uh, working together with others who are interested in um, learning more about research will greatly enhance the chance that you are able to succeed in doing that. Uh, this stuff is really, really hard to kind of do on your own. And if you can find someone who's going to encourage you, who's going to keep you focused, uh, you, you have a much better chance of success. Okay, so those with those three principles in mind, um, these are some basic strategies that I recommend for doing these collaborative research projects. Uh, certainly one, the first one there, co-researchers, uh, is the more traditional route. Uh, you get together with two or three people, design a, uh, run a, plan a study together, run it, pool your data, and then co-author manuscripts. Uh, very nice advantage of 
uh, dividing up the labor. Um, one that's a little bit more different that I kind of like is doing parallel studies. And this has some nice advantages uh, in that you are all running the same study. You're, you've planned the study and you're gonna run it and execute it, execute it, but you have control over your own data, your own classrooms. And ultimately you will analyze your own data and um, generate your own solo um, manuscript on that. And the advantage here is that by sharing the design, the three of you are doing the same study, for example, um, you keep the same schedule, you can share and coordinate and get support, ask questions, get help, and you're going through the study together, uh, but you do have your own uh, results and you can publish your own manuscript. The one I'm gonna focus on today is uh, one with a lead researcher. And this is kind of a combination of these two approaches. Okay, so here we have a lead researcher, someone who has a, probably a stronger background and more experience doing uh, quantitative studies and are looking to uh, run a very large scale project. Uh, maybe they have access to one or two classrooms at their own university, but they want to get uh, several different classrooms from a wider setting. And so by recruiting a team of other teachers, and I'm calling them interns, research interns, uh, but just other teachers who are interested in learning more about research uh, and creating a kind of symbiotic relationship, then uh, a couple of goals can be achieved. But here, basically the, the lead researcher is designing the study and coordinating the whole project. The interns, these other teachers, are conducting, those, conducting that study in their own classrooms. And they're collecting two sets of data. Uh, one set is for this main study. And then a secondary set is maybe connected to those ideas, but more specific to their situation. And the primary data will go to the lead researcher. And the research interns, the, those teachers, have control over that secondary data, and they can use that to write up their own manuscript. The lead researcher then can compile all the primary data from the different settings and generate a much more substantial uh, study uh, in a larger manuscript that might be appropriate for a major journal. Okay, so that's basically the idea. And um, the, the two sides have uh, commitments or contributions that they're going to make, and then they have both have benefits. So the lead researcher then is generating a procedures guide. They're going to coordinate the study, supervise everything, and then do some instruction so that they are teaching about the design, teaching about the analysis, and generally giving guidelines and tips throughout the project. The interns um, they're preparing for the study at, the, at their own institution, getting permission forms or whatever they need to set up the study. Uh, they do the intervention and collect the data, and they're making a commitment to see that through to the end. They will need to send some data back to the lead researcher. And then they are doing some supplementary tasks or collecting data for their own side as well. So the benefits for the lead researcher, again, they get an expanded data set. They're, they're seeing how this works in a variety of settings, um, can generate uh, art articles that are substantial enough to be published in a more major, uh, major, major journal. And then also with more of these researchers involved in the project, there's a wider audience for their work. Um, for these research interns, um, they're receiving instruction, they're getting some, some teaching and ideas, they're getting experience both with their own studies and then seeing how a larger scale study is managed. Um, they have their own personal uh, data that they can use and also um, generate their uh, manuscript that probably is good for like a departmental journal. So uh, to give you an example of how such a project might work, I'm gonna talk about my last um, kind of year long project that I ran, the 2018 Quantitative Research Training Project. 
Um, now, my purpose is uh, really this is a professional development project. I received a Kaken grant um, to run this program, and my main goal was to um, support language teachers and help them get practical experience and training in doing quantitative methods. However, this does fit with that model that I was describing before. So um, I ran the project in 2018. Uh, it lasted through the academic year, spring and fall. Um, prior to that, so in 2017, I started recruiting, giving presentations at local JALT chapters and um, at the, the conferences and was promoting it just as an opportunity to learn about quantitative research. And so I offered direct instruction. I was teaching about uh, statistics and research methodology. Uh, I created a study that all of the participating teachers uh, run in their own classrooms so that they are getting um, getting practical experience for doing research. And then I used an online um, website as a kind of project coordination site so that the teachers can um, collaborate together, share ideas, discuss problems, and kind of go through all the steps with a team in place. Okay, so uh, this, uh, everybody at this point is probably all familiar with doing online teaching. It felt a little bit novel when I was doing it two years ago, but times have changed. Uh, I had a Google Drive set up so that we could share materials. And then I was using any meeting. Uh, I never even heard of Zoom. I think this is where the, the guy that started Zoom used to work for this company and uh, for doing live instruction. And then we had Google groups set up for uh, collaborative uh, online discussion forum. The study that we used was based on a fairly common extensive reading activity. Uh, so if you've done extensive reading, you, you probably have done some variation of this. Uh, students are choosing a graded reader of their own interest they're doing the reading at home, and then maybe at some point they're coming into the classroom, sitting with a small group of students and discussing what they've read. And so we took uh, two variations of this activity and compared uh, student rating of their engagement at different stages. So in the one variation, they are reading, choosing the book on their own that they want to read, uh, reading it at home and then doing the group discussion. And then in the second variation, uh, the students in the group are selecting one reader that they're all going to read. So we use the X reading online library, which allowed this to happen. We didn't need multiple copies of the same reader. Uh, so they, uh, the students in the group would choose one that they were all going to read they read it at home and came back and discussed it. And we had an engagement questionnaire to get them to report how engaged they felt in each stage of those activities and then compared the findings. So in the big picture, um, in the spring semester, when we started the project, there was some preparation time and uh, we developed some questionnaires, piloted, did a little bit of pilot, and then collected the data. Uh, that lasted about eight to 10 weeks. And over the summer, then uh, the project participants uh, were tasked with getting their data all organized and cleaned and entered everything they needed to do. So that in the fall, we could start with the data analysis stage and then start working on their manuscripts. Uh, throughout that academic year, I was providing uh, lessons on statistics and guidance on running the study through the, uh, the online lectures. And then we had the discussion forum set up so that they could communicate with each other and share materials and ideas. So uh, I recruited, we had about 32 teachers who initially joined up. They were based at 20 universities around Japan. Um, most of them kind of came in on their own. A uh, few had partners and there was, I think, at least one or two groups that joined together. 
Uh, overall, more than 1,000 students uh, participated in the project. So they were part of the studies at these different universities. And so you should get a sense that we were how large scale this can go. Um, 28 teachers fought through that very, very difficult first semester and completed the data collection. We had a total of 16 online meetings and there was quite a bit of materials and questionnaires and other things that were created and shared together with the team. It was a very nice collaborative process. I'm aware of 24 publications. Um, I know that we're, there's still some delays and things are coming and I need to do one final check to see where everybody is. Uh, but uh, so far there has been a lot generated already. And this is to give you a sense of how uh, these varied studies can be brought together and that you can see a more um, unified look at, a, at, at uh, this as like a, a single large scale study. So the extensive reading SIG, uh, got, I got connected with them and we prepared, uh, many of the teachers who are involved in the project prepared, prepared short reports. Some of them wrote up um, the a partial findings from their studies. Some of them shared personal experiences. Um, these are from the, the partial findings. And so for this one question, how students reported engagement while reading. So either they were reading a book they chose themselves or they were reading a book that the group selected. And then we did, uh, they ran t-tests to compare the results. So for most of them, there was a tendency to favor or to show more engagement, report more engagement when they are reading the books that the groups selected. Uh, however, none of the findings were statistically significant. Uh, however, if we start to look at effect sizes, we can see some trends there, but really it's very, very small difference. Uh, but this is a way just even without doing a meta-analysis or combining the data into one larger scale analysis, we can see just this way we can start to um, combine these results. So there's definitely a lot of issues and considerations if we are starting a project like this. Um, it doesn't have to be initiated by the lead researcher. Um, it, it is possible for a group of teachers say, hey, let's work on a project together and find something that they're all interested in that fits with their classrooms. And then maybe look at a published study and say, let's do replication or a partial replication of this study and then reach out to the author and see if they may be willing to give some guidance and uh, maybe take on a larger role if something uh, attracts them about this. Uh, so it doesn't have to be that some researcher reaches out and tries to collect a group to run a study. Uh, for anyone that is in thinking about doing that, it is a lot of extra work. The administrative side is not small. Uh, you do need to be prepared. Uh, and if you are looking at, you have a, a, a grant, um, you might want to hire someone to be a project coordinator or try to have someone take on the administrative duties. Um, there's a lot of emailing that needs to be done uh, for this. A big part of this will be negotiating uh, roles and expectations. Um, you need to make clear exactly who is responsible for what so that there's no discussion or uh, conflict along the way. And some what if plans, if somebody has to back out, how is that data gonna be accounted for? And establishing, part of that will be establishing data, data ownership, making sure Again, everything is very clear from the beginning because there are some ethical considerations here. This is not a usual approach to doing research and um, you want to avoid having two people uh, publish different studies with the same data set. Okay, so um, again, from my perspective, I'm really, I'm always trying to encourage language teachers to get involved with uh, doing research. Uh, Japan is such a unique situation. We have a lot of teachers who are trained as teachers working at the university level. And they feel pressure, feel interested also just to do research, but don't have the training to do it. And so um, I think we can be a little creative here 
and look for ways to help each other out. And uh, collaborating in this process should allow us to kind of um, make some good relationships and generate more research that is of good quality and help people to learn more in the process. Okay, the very important first step is to find that little group of, of colleagues and say, hey, we should do a study together. All right, I think I'm that covers everything and I managed to do it within time. So I was just going to tell you that you're, you've got a five minute warning. So you did a great job. Nice. Wow. Very exciting. Okay, I'd like so, to uh, ask everyone to unmute your mics or yeah. use one of your reactions and give him a round of applause. Oh, and thank we'll you. Q and A. Greg, there were a couple of questions that okay, I yeah. thought we could start with. And then if we have time, we can take some of the other questions. Sure that people might have. The first one was at the beginning, you were talking about building a foundation of knowledge. Yep. And um, Andre asked, do you have some books you would recommend for um, building that foundation? Uh, yes, Andre. And let me... Um, and probably the rest of us want those books as well. Yep, and let me send out my... Um, email address and uh, I didn't, I usually have a little handout prepared and I don't have it so easily accessed. I'll be happy to send anything. Um, there, there are some, there are some, there's some stuff out there. The bad news is it really, really is very difficult to do it on your own. The best thing you can do is to take a class. I mean, there's just no other way around it. Um, there is uh, statistics.com um, which is an online uh, uh, like stats school. They teach different uh, stats programs. Um, that's, a, that's a really, really good way to do it. Uh, there are some books that I recommend that are fairly ac accessible. Um, however, just sitting down and reading on your own is very, very difficult to do without some extra guidance. And so at the very least, you want to have someone else who's doing it so that you can discuss back and forth, do I really understand this? Because in that discussion process, you'll find out where you are making mistakes. And, um, it, and without somebody else there, it's very, very hard to do on your own. Hey, thanks, Greg. Yeah, so yeah. that mentoring, the mentoring collabor collaboration is really important, isn't it? Yes, that's what I'm, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Greg, the other question that was in the chat is, um, when you were discussing collaborative research projects, um, yep. Andre also asked, is there support for obtaining ethics approval through the collaboration? Is there support for obtaining, um, Andre, can you elaborate on that? Okay, like for example, um, at, I think at pretty much at every institution, there's an ethics approval board that you have yep. to go yep. through, um, especially if you're collecting data that can obviously like point to the participant. Now, right, I think if it's right. autonomous, then you're probably safe. But if you are dealing with personal information, this is with qualitative research, for example, um, you have to go through the ethics approval board. And often in Japan, you're looking at having to submit Japanese applications. Oh, uh, yeah. And yeah, so yeah, that, that has to be done individually. My experience so far, and a lot of teachers that we worked with on the projects, they don't actually have to do that. Um, if your study is small enough, um, if you're not, obviously getting to something personal. Um, if it's part of a course, then actually, as long as you, you get the, the form signed by the students, you don't have to go through that uh, process. But, but it depends on the university. Like in my project, we had around 30 teachers. I think maybe three of them had to go through those steps. Everybody else pretty much did not. So you just kind of ask around. And my understanding is that a lot of them for this kind of study, we're not like you know, other ones it's different, but for this kind of classroom-based research, uh, they don't want to deal with having to approve of all of those kinds of studies when very clearly it's not going in that direction. So again, it depends. Okay, okay. I'm sorry to break this okay. up, but we're out of time. I'd like you to give Greg one more round of applause. Okay. Yep. Thank you very much. So That's sorry. Great. And if you have questions, I'll be very happy to uh, respond to you by email. And I